The scripture lesson this morning comes from the eighth chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Rome, verses 31 through 39. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Um, somebody, I told somebody what I was going to be preaching on today and uh, they said well you know here we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and you're going to be talking about death interesting timing um, but you know the reality of death is wound up in the story of Easter and the story of resurrection we can't have a story of resurrection right if we do not first go through the suffering death and death of Jesus and there is and there is no power there is in fact no point as far as we're concerned in the resurrection of Christ if death and resurrection have nothing to do with us Um, many years ago one of my first appointments I was sitting in my den one afternoon minding my own business by the way um, and the phone rang. This was way before cell phones. Anybody here remember before cell phones? Yes, thank goodness a few of us are left. Um, <clears throat> another preacher in town, it was a small town, and we pretty much knew, all of us preachers knew each other, and so this was a, another preacher that, in town that I knew was calling to ask for some help. Um, a friend of his, somebody that I knew, but not, we weren't friends like he and the, and the other preacher were, um, one of, a friend of his had been drinking too much and my preacher friend had been sitting with him while he got over it but he had to run some errands and asked if I would come sit for long enough for him to get those things done he'd only be gone a couple of hours and I said I'd be glad to do that and so I left the house drove around to where they were and when I got there the other preacher left so it was just the two of us and I, I tried to um, make some conversation, talk to him a little bit, uh, but uh, he wasn't really in great shape, and we didn't have a real close relationship, so that conversation didn't get far, but I was glad enough to do, you know, what I could do. Eventually, he left the room, which meant I didn't have to try to make conversation, and I figured that he would be back before long and I was right he came back in the room and I was glad to see him back until I realized that he had a gun with him when he came back in the room which was very disappointing to me um I um I have to admit that um you know some people at that point might have made the connection that excessive alcohol and firearms are a bad combination and, and that I might have, you know, suddenly needed to do my hair or something and leave. But for whatever reason, um, it, it never um, uh, dawned on me to try to do that. And I figured that the other preacher was going to come back and, you know, I mean, it wasn't like I was there forever. But as time went by, he did not, and I figured, you know, he was getting better. But as time went by, he was not getting better. Um, He got more and more agitated until we arrived at the point at which he was pointing the gun at me. Um, And that was when I realized that I don't like that. I really, I really don't like that. Um, And I would have preferred that he not do that. But that seemed to be what he really wanted to do um, at at that point. 
But I was very calm. Now, you're going to appreciate this a lot. I really was very calm. I remember that because I had been trained and knew exactly what I needed to do in that circumstance because I had watched hundreds of television shows over the years. And I had seen many shows where people were held at gunpoint, so I knew what worked and I knew what didn't work. And um, so I really was, I was very calm. We got to a point where it became clear to me that I needed to do something. So I just put my hand out and I said, man, you, you know you're not gonna shoot me, so why don't you just give me the gun? Which was the point that he pulled the trigger. Which was, which was yet another disappointment in the way this afternoon was going. Um, I, um, you know, it was, it probably is true that he wasn't really trying to hit me because he was like six or eight feet away. And even with a handgun, which I understand is harder to aim than a rifle, right? Long guns are easier to aim. But I figure even with a handgun, if, if he really wanted to get me, he, he probably, he could have kept shooting until something landed. Um, and when I turned around and looked, because I was sort of in front of a wall, so I, I turned around and looked, the, the bullet was like here in the, in the wall. And I should have taken comfort. That's pretty good clearance, don't you think? But it was, it was strangely not comforting to me. I don't know how to explain that. But, um, and, and then, um, then he said that he wanted me to lie on the floor, put my hands behind my head. You know, in football, we call this the surrender cobra. Have you seen that? That is exactly what that is, let me tell you. Um, so lying on the floor like this, it was carpeted, which I was very grateful for. It was much, much um, more comfortable than uh, tile or wood. And um, so I'm, I'm lying there on the floor and I had a moment of self-discovery. Now, self-discovery is very important as we come to understand ourselves better. And what I learned was that I am not MacGyver because I had always thought that when I, if I was ever held at gunpoint, I would leap across the room. Have you ever thought this? Nobody ever thought, I thought this, that I would leap across the room and disarm the person and restrain them with paper clips or whatever was available the way MacGyver would until the police came. But um, in fact, I took, a, um, I surveyed all the muscles in my body and there were no muscles getting ready to move. They were all very still at that, at that moment. But it's been, it has been good to understand that about myself ever since um, so that when this happens again, I will know, I will know how to react. Anyway, eventually, my very good friend who had invited me to spend the afternoon like this, right, that guy came back, which really did make me feel better because they were really good friends. And apparently, this had happened before, and I knew that they would talk and the gun would get put down and we could all go home. And so it was only a couple of minutes later until he was lying on the floor next to me. <laughs> um, um, so that did not work. Nothing was really working out the way, the way I was hoping it would. Um, eventually, the guy with the gun left the room um, and, the, and the other preacher um, made a move for the door. And I... Um, my first thought was, oh great, now the guy, wherever he is, has heard movement in the room, so if I try to follow, <laughs> the odds are I'll be the one to get shot, right? Because the other guy will be out the door. But then the second thought was how embarrassing it would be to just lie there until you get shot. I mean, I had a picture of the funeral service and somebody says, well, what happened? And said, well, you just lay there until you got shot. So, <laughs> so my fear, of humiliating my family overcame my fear of getting shot. I got up and ran out, ran out of the house. And um, I will admit, this may not have been the most caring thing to do, but I called the police and explained to them what happened and said I didn't like it. Would they do something about that? So um, anyway, I, I don't remember exactly. So some weeks later, um, I think, we were, I think we were called and asked to go visit him, the, the other preacher and I. 
And so we went um, to the facility where, where he was being held. And um, there were four of us in the room. There was the, the two of us and a, and a guy that no longer had the gun and, and a psychiatrist. And he started talking to us and telling us how much he appreciated our friendship and that um, he was looking forward to continuing our friendship. And, and, I'll, and this really was not very nice, but it reached a point and I said, I, I think you need to understand that when you shoot a gun at somebody, it impacts your relationship. <clears throat> and I, I'm pretty sure it has impacted our relationship. And I'm sorry about that. So it was at that point that the psychiatrist spoke up and he said, well, you need to understand that you were never actually in any danger because, <laughs> right, <laughs> he said you were never actually in any danger because he wasn't going to actually shoot you. Now, I did not speak what was in my head at the moment, <clears throat> but I thought, you know, it's one thing to say it when we're sitting inside a secure facility and you know that nobody's got a gun or alcohol. But I will say that when I was lying on that floor, it was not entirely clear to me that I would not get hurt. Um, so anyway, his comment did bring back to my mind a couple of things that I did think about that afternoon and thought about a lot. The first one was to wonder what it would feel like to be shot. I did think, you know, I wonder if, so if I wind up being shot, what will that feel like and what is it, does it matter where, where you get shot? But the thing I thought about the most was how um, I might not go home, right? And there was no big um, parting ceremony, right? No, not lots of hugs and I love you and all this kind of stuff, right? I just hung up the phone, got the car, drove across town, and then I might never see my family again. It was, it was surreal to think that a day that started so normally, right, might be the day I died. <clears throat> well, you know, when we're, when we're young, I think pretty much all of us um, really sort of act and, and believe that we're on some level immortal, right? It won't we won't get hurt. Um, our bodies won't change when we hit our 30s and 40s. You know, we'll always be the same. Um, the idea that the day will come, eventually it will be the last day that we have in this life um, is a theory, but it's not real for us when we're young enough. And yet life doesn't it, brings twists and turns and moments that slowly make our own mortality more and more real. That, that afternoon, obviously, was one of those moments for me. Um, many, if not most of you, probably have had moments similar in your lives when your mortality becomes more, more real to you. Um, because we are mortal and the day will come when these bodies of flesh and blood will fail us. It will happen. It will happen without exception. For centuries, um, in the early years of the church, there was a body of Christian literature that was intended, uh, it was devoted to the art of dying. It was intended to help Christians face that inevitable moment when um, death would visit them occasionally through martyrdom, more commonly, of course, through the ordinary course of life that comes to all of us. By Wesley's day, that tradition had pretty much um, gone away, faded away, but he rediscovered it and actually began to seek to have opportunities to be with people who were close to death or dying and he, he did it in order both to learn from those who were dying well and to share with those who did not know how to die well. Um, 
his work in that area um, on, the, on the art of dying was so successful that early Methodists were actually known for their good deaths. Did you know that? In our tradition, we Methodists were, were known as people who faced death better than just about anybody. There's a quote from a, a doctor who had worked with a number of um, Wesley's followers and he was talking to John's brother Charles and he said this, most people die for fear of dying but I never met such people as yours. They are none of them afraid of death but are calm and patient to the last. So how, how do we who are Christians in this age and culture approach death with the same peace? What Wesley knew Um, more deeply than anything else was that the secret to dying well was to live a life of faith well. He he saw it um, in the lives and the witness of the people that he spent time with as death approached. The Spirit of God was so clearly evident in their lives that he regularly published accounts of their dying testimony as a way to encourage other Christians in his movement and the common theme in all of those instances was this that the manner in which they died was simply the manner in which they lived writing about one such believer who had recently died Wesley wrote he died as he lived in the full assurance of faith praising God with his last breath we had a um, We had a a, a staff retreat back in the fall, and we all read a book as part of that. That's what you do on retreats, right? But something that I think that I will always remember, I gleaned from that book in our conversation, was the statement that when times of crisis come, people generally do not rise to the occasion, which I learned for myself that afternoon. People, when times of crisis come, people generally do not rise to the occasion. They revert to their habits and their training. Most of us, when our time to die comes, will have had years to create the habits that shape who we are. May we live our lives seeking God, learning to trust the one who made us and made all things, so that when we come to the end of our days upon this earth, we might be able to say with Paul, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord let us pray almighty God the one who gave us life in the beginning the one who watches over us all the days of this life the one who waits for us when this life is over so fill us with faith and courage and trust in you that we will discover that when all is said and done, your love will live within us with such power that nothing in all the world, in all time, will be able to separate us from Christ, not even death. Amen. My name is Rachel Caracello, and I'm one of the pastors at Advent United Methodist Church. And I want to say thank you for joining our online campus today. If you'd like to learn more about Advent, please check out our website at advent-umc.org. Or better yet, come and worship with us in person. Every Sunday morning, worship services at our Five Forks campus begin at 9 and 10.30 a.m. And at our Scuffletown campus, worship begins at 10 a.m. We believe that being together in corporate worship is incredibly important, and we look forward to seeing you soon.